but are they, in, are they can they hear what we're saying now? I I can hear you guys. Can you can you hear me? That's. Um, so yeah, basically I'm presenting. Oh dear. I can't hear you guys anymore. Right. I, I'm afraid I can't hear you, so I, I, I just need some confirmation that I'm audible. Uh, I think somehow, um, about 20 seconds ago, I lost all, all contact, both visual and, and audio. So if someone could just write in the in the, um, okay, excellent. So I'll just uh, I'll speak without being able to hear you, and I'll be as quick as possible. Um, I hope the presentation is visible too. So let me let me start by saying thank you to Rico for all the excellent work that's gone into organizing today. I'm really, really pleased that we can now formally launch. Um, given time constraints, I just want to weave together a number of empirical and conceptual threads in order to sketch the contours of what I hope is, is something worth discussing uh, for you know, our attempts to come to terms with, with the politics of disorder. And my starting point really today is um, is Michael Billig's famous book, uh, Banal Nationalism. When I used to teach a module on nationalism, I always used to say to students, this is the single most important book on nationalism written over the last then 20, now 25 years. And I guess I, stack, I stand by that assessment. And there are two ideas from Michael Billig that I want to, to, to highlight. First, his really important, the widely overlooked distinction between hot and banal nationalism banal nationalism being the, the daily reproduction of nationalist ways of thinking, um, of interpreting, and of, of practicing the world, as, as it were, um, the kind of daily waving of flags. And the second idea is what Billy calls the national dixies, uh, by which he refers to a, a series of ubiquitous acts of daily rhetorical pointings at the nation state. And he talks in particular about uh, sort of topographical references to here as opposed to there. Think about the media, think about sporting competitions, think about weather forecasts, he says. Um, and secondly, the ubiquitous use of personal pronouns. We as opposed to they, us as opposed to them. That's the essence, or that's part of the essence of banal nationalism. Now, in recent work, I've tried to build on that by, by bringing in memory and drawing on, on John Austin's terms of a concept of speech acts, I've tried to, to kind of think about memory acts. Um, and that in itself kind of interfaces with uh, another important contribution to the literature by Avishai Margalit, who talks about the relationship between communities and cultural memories. Now, to Margalit, uh, the whole the equation starts with communities, which he conceives of as, as fairly primordial units. So his argument is that uh, communities of culture, of, of ethnicity, of religion, or of nation are held together by thick relations and in part by the cultural memories that are shared only within that particular community, as opposed to rare instances of um, universal memories, he terms this the morality of memory, that cut across uh, ethnic, religious, national boundaries. And, and in relation to that, Margaret really mainly talks about genocide as, as pretty much the only sort of phenomenon that is able, that, that enables people to remember across boundaries. Now, what I'd like to argue and what I have argued is that the notion of memory acts enables us to invert the analytical vector of Margaret's analysis. And you kind of argue actually it starts with the, the, the kind of constructive work that memory, cultural memory performs, and that actually goes into the construction and reproduction of, of groups and of communities. So we need to invert the, uh, the equation. That's, that's the sort of theoretical background. Let's kind of think about some of the things um, this might enable us to say. And I've just kind of randomly picked a number of, um, of recent headlines, uh, items of news in, in sort of in line with, with, with uh, Billig's uh, discussion. Um, and I just want to remind us all of some of the pictures, if they come up, um, that were all around all of us. Well, I wasn't in the country, thankfully, I've got to say, at the time. But, uh, you know, recent European football uh, competition. Uh, think of the ubiquity of the flags, of the, the shirts. Uh, think of the, uh, the, the, you know, the... Uh, the they exist, the, the constant references to us as opposed to them. Think of the topographical places, the landmarks uh, that form the backdrop to some of this, uh, all kind of 
core components of, of Billig's notion of banal nationalism. To me, I think the only real real question is, um, is this still banal or already hot nationalism in, in Billig's terminology? Now, let's leave this in the background. Now, you know, a few other headlines which I don't really have time to go into. It's also worth remem remembering just how deeply embedded uh, that kind of football nationalism is in, in the public domain and in popular culture. Now, I just want to briefly bring in Henning Kronwart, who wrote about this really, really suggestively uh, some time ago, and who convincingly argues that whenever uh, football is being talked about and in the domain of banal or perhaps not so banal English nationalism, especially when it comes to confrontations clashes with Germany, the, the trope of two world wars and one world cup, cup is only just around the corner. And Gonard um, argues that really compellingly in relation to the, the 1996 um, European football competition. Uh, again, you know, the historical uh, references, and I'd like to call this a form of temporal deixis, which Billig doesn't talk, talk about, acts of pointing at, at purported key moments in national history. The, the temporal deixis in these contexts didn't just uh, or doesn't just reference 1966, but it tends to reference uh, World War Wars One and World War Two, and that kind of ties in with how I first started th to think about all of this and uh, how I started to think about memory nationalism um, a few years ago when I wrote an article for Discover Society, um, and at the time I was struck by some of the commemoration of World War One when parts of the, the commemoration included the display of 888,246 ceramic poppies, one for each a uh, victim of World War One from the Commonwealth. Um, I think that's a clear example of what I would call memory nationalism. And I think it begs the question why on earth the choice was made not to include, not to display 15 million ceramic poppies, one for each victim of World War One, and not just, uh, regardless of nationality, and not just from the Commonwealth. Now, we might say, you might say, what's the point of all of this? Are there alternatives? Am I sort of arguing normatively? And the answer is no, I'm certainly not arguing normatively, but empirically. So I want to take this in the in the empirical direction that I, I know best towards Central Europe, um, where you know memory nationalism abounds, is, is 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 also ubiquitous, but there are noticeable counter discourses, counter discourses that I would call transnational memory acts. One example uh, displayed on the left, a recent book by a close colleague and friend of mine, a historian from the States, David Loft, whose title, the title of the book actually doesn't do justice to the analysis. So the, the map you can vaguely make out is of Central Europe or a section of Central Europe. I'm moving the cursor across what is today's Austro-Czech border. Um, you've got the Czech Republic to the north, Austria to the south. And Luft's argument is that actually from the late 18th until the, the early 20th centuries, this space that cuts across what subsequent, subsequent, subsequently became one of the most heavily guarded borders on the European continent, that regional space really was inter-ethnic, multilingual, to some extent more German-speaking in the, the cultural elites, but also Czech-speaking. And that cultural space cannot be seen and made sense of if we stick to a national lens for remembering. Um, and he kind of traces a whole range of literary and cultural movements all the way to psychoanalysis and, and the Austrian school of, of economics, but also actually the early stages of political science and empirical social research to this particular regional and distinctly inter-linguistic uh, and intercultural space. Closer to the UK, uh, we might think of Gominda Bambra's really excellent work on rethinking modernity when she makes a similar argument. Uh, insisting that we need to resuscitate the idea of connected histories, connected histories that cut across uh, enormous uh, cultural distances and geographical space, and that really cut across all the national ways of remembering and thinking about history, uh, and that cut across the, the colonial and post-colonial eras. To give you more examples, similar maps, same space I just alerted you to. This is again the, the Austrian Czech border. I've recently written about an, a series of museum exhibits over the last few years. Museum exhibits that took place in what is, is Bohemia, the part of the Czech Republic, Upper Austria and Lower Austria, and that took place over the last 10 years, each of which tried to capture and resuscitate histories. Again, I move the cursor over the boundary, over the border. The, histories that cut across for centuries um, the Austrian-Czech border um, and histories that have systematically been erased, uh, <clears throat> suppressed and overlooked by a memory nationalism of sorts. 
On the other side, uh, this is the north of, of Austria. I'm now pointing you towards the south. This is the, the region of Styria. Historically, this region cut across what is now the Austrian-Slovenian border. I'm moving uh, the cursor once again. Um, this is a region that has similarly been dom long dominated by various forms of memory nationalism, both on the Slovenian and on the Austrian side of the border. And yet recent museum exhibits have, have attempted to resuscitate in these acts of transnational memory acts, as I call them, uh, inter-regional, inter-ethnic, uh, if you like, cosmopolitan uh, life worlds that, that a, a nationalist frame uh, systematically, as I said, uh, silences or even erases. And just the other day, a couple of days ago, I, I learned of a really fascinating, fascinating project that doesn't use the term transnational memory acts, but amounts to, to nothing less than that. The project is entitled Reading the Danube. Remember the Danube being, being uh, you know, Central Europe's most uh, sort of formidable river that cuts across 10 different nation states, including Germany, Austria, uh, Slovakia, Hungary, and so on and so forth. And this project tries to, to capture literary and culturary tra cultural traces of how the river uh, sort of shapes local landscapes and local acts of remembering, clearly uh, sidestepping uh, memory nationalism, as I call it. Now, I want to, to kind of ask the question whether transnational memory acts are by definition critical and counter-hegemonic. And I think in a nutshell, I'm arguing that yes, they are. And by that, I mean they need to engage critically with existing configurations and hierarchies of power. And it's also actually easier to make this argument through an example of what transnational memory acts are not. So I'll give you an example of what they are not. Uh, Lee Turner, former British ambassador to, to Austria, as it happens, recently gave an interview in a tabloid newspaper in which he had the following to say about the Commonwealth. He defines the Commonwealth, and I quote, as a wonderful association from which its 54 member states derive much strength. Even countries who were never part of the empire now want to join. This helps tremendously. For we, note the national DXs, please, have defined our aim of, of, as that of, being, of becoming a global trading power. Now, this does not qualify as a transnational memory act, certainly not as a critical one. It's highly selective in how it reads and misconstructs and, and, and retells the history of empire, completely taking out questions of power and hierarchy. And it's clearly instrumentalized by the, the Brexit or post-Brexit uh, narrative of, of Britain as a global trading power. I'll, I'll leave all the question about how that maps onto the current crisis for, for later discussions. But this is not what, what a, you know, a transnational memory act worthy of its name uh, amounts to. But that doesn't answer all the, the critical and important questions here. So I think I, I want to next just point out that the, the, this entire sort of conceptual strand gets us quickly into well-known and murky conceptual waters. Uh, it raises the question as to what historians and social scientists ought to make of cultural memories in the first place, or how memory and often identity politics map onto historiography. So just to restate uh, very quickly a number of famous, well-known positions, Fogo and Kanschneiner in 2006 argued that collective memory is actually a slippery phenomenon. It's not history in the academic sense, but sometimes made from similar materials. Against that, they depict the postmodern challenge as amounting to a, a radical deconstruction of any distinction between history and memory. Dominic Lacapra had already argued similarly. He sort of argued that there's a neo-positivist history that conceptualizes itself as a form of demythologizing his uh, memory, as opposed to the postmodern wave, which regards any memory as, as intrinsically authentic and automatically or existentially rich, or even memory as history's matrix and muse. As a counterposition to that, Timothy Garton Ashton entered the, uh, the debate professing, as, as he called it, an alert, an al his own allergy to some of the ludicrous frivolities of postmodern historiography. Instead, he advocated that contextualization and the skilled balancing, balancing of intellectual distance and imaginative sympathy will reveal a truth, not with a capital T, but T, but still a, a real and important one. And I think what we've got here is, is a version of what social scientists recognize as a double hermeneutic. The difficult question as to what we do in reinterpreting pre-interpreted social realities, or in this particular case, in how we reinterpret uh, critically, uh, and yet obviously sensitive to context, pre-interpreted cultural memories. So now you might say this is this is rather overloaded. Why does this matter for, for a politics of disorder? In the briefest possible terms, I want to bring this full circle. I want to remind everyone of Duncan Bell's really suggestive notion of the national mythscape, which you've got on this slide. According to Bell, the national mythscape is an extended discursive realm 
within which national myths or narratives of the national past are continually being debated. And he juxtaposes dominant to subaltern national myths. And, and you know, the, the kind of result is, is ongoing and never complete. Now, I'm arguing for a superimposition of, of Michael Billick's work on no, on this notion of the national mythscape in order to conceptualize how some national myth, nationalist myths are very much um, debated reflexively, deliberately, and how others sort of seep into the, the, the domain of, of banal nationalism, where they operate with this, this what I call the temporal deixis, the kind of subtle, barely noticed, but ubiquitous reference to key moments in national history. And at the same time, how these uh, everyday acts of remembering transport a particular nationalist narrative. The distinction between banal and, and hot nationalism then enables us to think about how and under which social circumstances this temporal deixis underpinning banal nationalism can switch from being banal into hot. And I kind of invite us all to think about some of the early images and some of the, the kind of ubiquitous, seemingly everyday forms of nationalism and what other kinds of politics they transpose and transmit. I think I'm out of time. Thank you again. And I look forward to the other presentations, hoping that I can hear you guys, because at the moment I'm speaking to, to myself. So I hope this, this, this at least was audible and visible to everyone in the room. Over to you. Okay, thanks, Christian. Uh, not that you can hear us, but thank you anyway. Uh, next, Nick is going to come and present. If that's that? okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Oh, oh, fantastic. Wow. Okay, thanks, Christian. Oh, okay. And there's a, there's, a, there's a bit of a delay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I suppose it's probably best if, if can we get off that before yes. I start talking, or well, that's going to be very weird. I'm going to start talking and then I'm going to start talking again. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Nick. So Nick's going to present a paper called Include the Ignorant, and um, please include me. Fantastic. Thank you. So, um, oh, no, no, that's not good. Let's, get, let's just do the this will, this will be for the time being. Oh no! As you did it before. We did it before. Yeah, just oh, it's because it's because I went. I tried presenter view, and then doing that must have switched off mirroring. Yeah, it's mirror display. Okay. Okay. All right. That's big enough. And go. Okay. So the um. Uh, thanks very much for coming here. It's, it's a wonderful turnout for like, uh, the, you know, a, not, a, not an easy week for many of us. And thanks so much to Rico for kind of for pursuing and like pushing ahead with this. I, I really, really appreciate it. Now, the overall message of this talk is that democratic politics is intrinsically disorderly. It's got lots of nuisances and kind of nastiness associated with it. And to some extent, you can't extract all of that bad stuff while still maintaining the good stuff in, uh, in democracy. Now, the problem is, liberals have always found this kind of nastiness associated with democracy rather unpalatable. And so at various points, they've tried to come up with ways of maybe refining or changing the way that it kind of works. So that it kind of looks, you know, all a bit neater and more civil and collegial and it kind of works out very well. And in particular, they've often looked at sort of people, they try to judge the people who appear to be bringing the nastiness in and to try and like push them out, if not entirely, but at least kind of reducing their, their voice. And more, most recently, they tend to call these people the ignorant. Um, and our basic um, argument, so this is actually a kind of double bill because you're going to get a bit of Aris in a bit. There's quite a lot of Aris in this, in this paper, in this presentation as well. So he's, he's getting actually two presentations for this, for this session, but I'm, I'm going to uh, talk, talk about it. So my outline is, um, I'm going to briefly go over classical liberal criticisms of democracy. And then I'm going to introduce something that some classical liberals have cooked up recently called epistocracy as an alternative. Um, and then I'm going to uh, attack epistocracy by um, basically describing um, uh, consumer ignorance in competitive markets as a challenge to the idea that it's important that everyone is knowledgeable in, uh, in the democratic process. Um, and then I'm going to sort of re-describe democracy as, um, as a competitive discovery process. And then 
um, I'm going to discuss inclusion as an ep epistemic quality of democracy. Therefore, actually including everyone, including the supposedly ignorant, is essential for getting democracy to actually work as well as it normally does. And um, if, I, if I'm not like yanked off, um, I'll, um, uh, uh, the, the, um, this, this presentation, I'll, um, I'll talk about what that might mean in terms of reforms as well. So uh, classical liberal fears about modern democracy goes quite far back. So um, Benjamin Constant, democratic reformer, um, who was uh, also keen to reform a convulsive tyranny. He was always like looking at each reform and kind of figuring out whether, whether it was going to be worth the, um, worth the gain in terms of the disadvantage. John Stuart Mill, um, a radical and a liberal, um, by certainly very much by the standards of his day. So he favoured widening the franchise beyond what was then the propertied classes in England. But also he liked the idea of potentially weighting votes towards the better informed. He quite liked the idea that, for example, graduates of Oxford and Cambridge got like extra votes and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, uh, uh, Hayek, um, Hayek had a, a somewhat even more kind of sceptical, kind of indirect view on democracy. He quite liked it, but in a purely instrumental fashion. So he said that as soon as the outcomes it's producing are kind of unpalatable or wrong in some way, uh, we may have to like constrict it, place some parameters on it, that kind of thing. And more recently, we've got uh, Kaplan and, and Somin, who uh, have tried to kind of formalize some of these concerns. They're basically saying that voters are rationally ignorant of relevant facts and also rationally irrational, irrational when it comes to expressing beliefs and preferences. In other words, uh, voters, because they know that they can't really affect an outcome as an individual, are likely to kind of just say whatever it is that's going to make them happy. It's not actually going to input into the process in a very effective way. Um, and um, uh, actually, my supervisor and, and Aris's at uh, King, King's College London, uh, Mark Pennington, he uh, argues that democratic processes cannot communicate critical tacit knowledge in a way that he argues that markets are kind of capable of doing so. Um, now, um, uh, Jason Brennan is a contributor to this kind of discourse. Uh, so he's, he's based at Georgetown. And he was very lucky. He published his book Against Democracy in 2016, when it so happened a whole bunch of people were just at the time going like, oh, God, how awful is democracy, both over here and in, um, and in, in, in the United States. So his, his book got picked up rather um, uh, in, in a, in a um, uh, very popular fashion. Um, and so his argument is that citizens can be classified into three categories. You've got the hobbits who are ignorant and uninterested in politics, generally speaking, and actually really have to be kind of persuaded to vote at all. You've got the hooligans who are engaged in politics, but actually is a tribal conflict. They love it for, for, for kind of for this sort of um, uh, sociotropic reason. Um, and they're not that interested in policy ideas. If a policy idea is presented uh, by their side, say the conservatives, uh, they'll accept it and think, oh, that sounds like a great idea. Presented by the other side, they'll hate it. So they're, they're kind of like partisan, not really very interested in the policy side. And then he's got Vulcans, uh, who are the more informed and cool-headed, the kind of hopes that most academics are kind of a little bit like this. And they're interested in the performance of public policies, but they're always a strict minority in any democratic system. Um, so uh, the upshot of this observation is his case for epistocracy. And the epistemic democratic process is noisy uh, because it's got many, many ill-informed participants in it. Uh, that's the kind of the, the hobbits who are kind of not very profoundly ignorant and really need any motivation to kind of participate at all. But at the same time, if it was just noisy, that wouldn't really matter because hopefully the noise would kind of cancel each other out. No, instead, it's also biased towards tribal values, uh, which is like tends to be sociotropic at like the community level and nationalist at the, you know, at a kind of larger level. But there's relatively good knowledge and capacity for political judgment out there just among a fraction of the citizens. And the group of citizens can be identified with a test of political knowledge. So just ask them if they know who their MP is, how many MPs there are, very basic stuff. That will kind of be the thing that he suggests as a kind of test. And then you add weight to their votes in some way. You don't say that, that, that the other the people who fail that test can't vote, but maybe you know, you kind of give them a, a percentage less, uh, less um, of a role in the final decision. Now, our argument in responding to this is we have to, we have to kind of highlight whether this kind of ignorance really matters for a complex system such as the democratic process. So consumers are hobbits, occasionally hooligans, um, when it comes to buying smartphones and joining communication networks. They have very little or no technical knowledge. I have absolutely no idea how this things work. It's like magic, so far as I'm concerned. Um, at the platform level, at the same time, 
uh, platforms are linked to a duopoly currently between uh, Apple and Google. That's basically who your choice is. Of, uh, your, your choice is. Um, so it's certainly not a, com a perfectly competitive market. It's not as if anyone can just set up a new firm and try and compete with Google straight away. But it's sufficiently rivalrous to produce constant gains, even for very ignorant consumers. And consumers uh, exhibit similar sociotropic biases as democratic as citizens. So, for example, uh, they, uh, you know, they, they, they might go for anti-GMO uh, kind of um, uh, products. They might buy local because they kind of care about their community in some way um, and kind of be persuaded to kind of like pick things that are not really in their own consumer interest. Um, nevertheless, markets work quite well anyway. They process all that information, all those kind of preferences, and make it work in, in a way, at least according to the people that we're arguing with. They're kind of like this sort of this sort of classical liberal discourse that say markets, yay, democracy. Ugh. We're kind of going, actually, if you want to say that, that markets work in these in this kind of rivalry and nasty way, you've got to admit that democracy has some of these components as well. So ignorance and irrationality alone is not a barrier to successful social outcomes. The institutions matter. Um, and so this is where we try and put our um, uh, our own uh, kind of account, account in place. So basically. There are two kind of, uh, sort of, sort of simple static accounts of the way democracy is supposed to work. One is this idea of preference aggregation, which is basically this idea where you've got lots and lots of competing interests uh, and values in society that are kind of intrinsically irreconcilable and could lead to violent conflict. But what you do is you have a democratic constitution, which means you go out and vote. You say, these are my, these are my interests. You vote for the party that most clo closely matches your, in your, your interests. The parties compete for those interests. And uh, every five years or so, you get this, this sort of cycle where the party that has successfully appealed to, every, to, to a bare majority or even just a, you know, a, a kind of a, a reasonably large minority, they get to win. And uh, no one has any violence. And so everyone benefits from, from this kind of competition. Um, the other one, a little bit more kind of idealistic, is this notion of judgment ag aggregation. So rather than are competing over interests, People are going to think instead about what is right for society. They're going to think about this very, very carefully. They're going to think all their experiences. They're going to talk to people and then they're going to vote. And then hopefully the idea is that this the common judgment, um, you know, the kind of Rousseauian social contract kind of I ideal uh, will usually produce a kind of good, a good answer. Um, now, the uh, epist epistocratic critique is premised on either a static judgment account, which I've just said, or a deliberative account of democracy. Um, and the, uh, the idea here is that, um, that uh, if you can have some degree of, of um, discussion and um, uh, you know, kind of, a, a kind of a, an appropriate discussion of values, eventually you'll see a kind of convergence of judgments so that people will kind of realize um, how, you know, what is genuinely for the, the common good. And this is kind of where uh, Brennan's argument particularly bites, because when you look empirically at democratic discussion, it doesn't look very much like that at all. Um, now, our response is that the epistemic value of democracy is not selection among a given set of policy options, but rather discovery of new options based on a dynamic competition between rival proposals and policymakers. So this is kind of where we put it. So it's dynamic, it's still got interests, and it's got competition involved. So it's got all that kind of like uh, that sort of... Um, uh, kind of more realistic account of how people actually tend to win elections, but it's not just pure aggregation. It's actually part of discovering new ways in which we can work well together. And the dynamic creation of new knowledge cannot be captured in the judgments of more knowledgeable citizens on specific dimensions. So just because someone knows who their MP is doesn't mean that they're, they're going to be the ones who actually get to generate this new knowledge. Um, so what we offer is a more realistic conception of democratic rivalry. We draw a parallel between democratic the democratic process and the market process, um, and this involves a rejection of the neoclassical view of knowledge. In both processes, what is known is generated and discovered in social interactions, so that is kind of epistemic emergence. You don't go into the process knowing what the outcome is going to be, or even knowing what the best policy is going to be, but rather in the process of competition, you end up coming up with a better idea uh, than what you um, uh, that, that, than what any any single individual kind of began with. And there's also competition among actors who are partial to their own interests, experience, ideas, and values. And this is an asymmetrical competitive model of politics that establishes relations of accountability and cont contestability. So the epistemic capacity of a political system related to, institu 
um, the, the epistemic capacity of the political system is related to the institutions and structures of accountability and contestability. Um, and so this is, uh, uh, um, in here we're drawing on some work from Aris, which um, basically argues that the, the main value of democracy in the end is the ability to kind of um, constrain, though not eliminate, the uh, privileged insiders. So in other words, there's always going to be people who kind of are much, much more knowledgeable about, say, the policy process or about the likely outcomes of each policy. The point is to get the institutions working so that they're incentivized to, um, uh, to, act, to, to try and appeal to a reasonably large number of people. And this only matters if you've included everyone in the process in some way. Um, so uh, what is the um, uh, implications for evaluating democratic constitutions? Well, the people that we're dealing with are focusing on the United States. So many of our reform proposals are kind of basically saying, this is how you make the United States genuinely more democratic than it already is. But basically, epistocracy proposes weighting vote power towards those with more factual knowledge and politics and policy and discouraging the ignorant from voting in one way or another. In practice, this means reducing the influence of the relatively disadvantaged who have less time and fewer resources to become informed about public affairs. Um, making democracy more competitive would mean instead making it easier to vote, whether in person or using alternatives. Now, we also know that markets can remain fairly competitive with relatively few competing firms, so long as they face theoretical competition and disruption from new entrants. So it's not the fact there is like a, a competitor Google out there. It's the point that if Google messed up really badly, someone else would come in and take their place. Um, that's, the, that's the theory anyway. Yet in the United States especially, voting rules deliberately favor two major parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. And this is rather equivalent to consolidating uh, Google and Apple in the phone software market with legislative support by going like, oh yeah, no, it's not only the case that you de facto have to pick Apple or Google, now we're going to write that into legislation as well, so that the only possible competition is between Apple and Google. Um, proportional systems, um, so proportional representational systems are probably more competitive than majoritarian systems. So we have a majoritarian system in this country, the United States is a very majoritarian system because of its legislative kind of twist that it, um, that it gives. Um, so in general, we say that proportional representation is something that overall is probably worth pushing towards. Um, but even marginal reforms, such as awarding electoral college votes by vote share, would move the US towards having a more competitive democracy. And so our overall account is, if you think that this uh, nature of, of social processes uh, works, you know, if, um, if you think that kind of markets work through competition, then ultimately you should also endorse the notion that uh, um, uh, that competitive democracies are more likely to work than this kind of more refined idea where you kind of exclude a bunch of people from uh, from having uh, consequential decisions. Um, uh, so um, yeah, there there we are. Thanks very much. Looking forward to your questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, we'll do question. We'll do the Q and A at the end after the final two presentations. So I was going to ask Andrea to come next. Uh, and Andrea, her paper is on medical nationalism and emerging infectious disease, the pandemic of nationalism and the nationalism of pandemic. So I think actually both, I mean, as yeah, you've seen with all the of these... Yeah, you can get in front of the... Uh, as you see with all of these papers, I think there's really a great contemporary resonance. Thank you, Riku. So I decided to, to tell you a little bit more about a project that I'm currently working on. I'm done with the first stage of the project and I thought it would be interesting because it explains how I got stuck in politics of disorder and how I got stuck in medical nationalism. I'm actually a lawyer, but I'm interested in everything about the law except for its rules. I'm interested in how the law sits with other disciplines. I'm interested in its inherent complexity. I'm interested in the life world that it creates, its complicity in the life world in which we live everything except the black letter law. Now, one of my focus areas is medical and health law. And you can imagine that the global health crisis through which we are all living was and is, of course, very interesting to me, mm -hmm. especially because I work a lot on the right to health and global health. Um, but when you talk about health rights, and, and here you will sense quite quickly that I am indeed interested in everything about the law except its rules, um, I'm always very skeptic about socioeconomic rights or second generation rights like the right to health because it's 
very different. Keep them in five moments to all kinds of treatments that they might need, even experimental treatments. And currently quite a big topic in the UK, but also doesn't really mean that you can insist on treatment that you need within a reasonable period of time. Having the right to health is fine in a constitution like you find in many modern constitutions, especially on the African continent, new constitutions, is fuzzy. It's difficult to give content to, it's difficult to realize, and it's difficult to enforce. Now, when you go um, to, to global health, um, you move from second generation rights to third generation rights. Now, third generation rights are solidarity rights. Those are the rights that um, relatively recently um, became important because of different conceptions of human dignity and also um, because of large crises like COVID-19 and environmental crises that, um, you know, place the focus on collective responsibilities and collective duties for the collective good. But even at the global level, you find the same problems with global health rights. Difficult to, to give content to, difficult to agree what the minimum threshold content of the right of health or global health ought to be. Very difficult to realize and also difficult to enforce. Even if you think about international human rights treaties, um, which do give some or, or provide for some obligations on nation states in terms of providing for the health rights of, you know, their national populations as well as collective responsibilities, those are not sanctioned, it's soft law, and it's usually um, only through political will really that those are enforced. So that's a little bit of background on the work that I usually do. And in light of the COVID pandemic, how I got stuck in medical nationalism. So despite being a global pandemic, the responses to COVID-19 have been intensely local and nationally unique. Throughout the pandemic, we have seen how different nations deal with COVID-19 differently, the justifications they make for the decisions they make, the restrictions they impose, and also how their citizens respond differently there too. It is here where you can observe medical nationalism. Medical nationalism I define as a nation-centric understanding of health and health care. Medical nationalism can play a particularly important role in either promoting or impeding the right to health. In the United Kingdom, for example, the National Health Service, the NHS, is the epitome of English medical nationalism. In the run-up to the Brexit referendum, the NHS was used as a divisive tool by politicians to build a chain of equivalence between immigration, austerity, and British community traditions. And today, in the face of the global pandemic, NHS rhetoric is used to unify the nation and instill a sense of solidarity and community for all of us to comply with the public health measures. It is this medical nationalism that I am interested in exploring this in light of COVID-19 and also in terms of those aspiration rights of global health and the right to health with which I started my presentation. I also rely on my work on Benedict Anderson's um, imagined political community, which is neither false or fictionalized, but rather the product of the unself-conscious exercise of abstract thought. And in my work, you can view this imagined community either in terms of the imaginary imaginaries that medical nationalism instills or that inform medical nationalism or the aspiring to an imaginary right to health, global health and health security. Now, when I started working on nationalism, the first problem that I encountered was that it's actually very complex, it's opaque, it's impossible to capture empirically. Um, it operates and, and features at so many different levels and in so many different forms. And what's quite curious is that while the political scientists in the room will tell us that nationalism is an essentially contested concept, nobody can really agree on its meaning, usage, authority, 
it seems as though all of us are talking about nationalism during COVID-19 as if all of us agree we've got a collective understanding as to what it means. We talk about vaccine nationalism. If you do a literature review on all of the articles that's been published on vaccine nationalism, I've found only one in which an author actually tried to define it. There's just this assumption all of a sudden that nationalism is no longer an, es uh, an essentially contested concept. So the first stage of the project, which I've recently completed, and which I would like to publish to get some feedback on next, was for me to kind of create a taxonomy of definitions. I've got a definition for medical nationalism, but for me to actually try and empirically capture medical nationalism, I had to come up with incidences or occurrences that I can define and that I can then use to measure, measure what's happening in the UK or any other country for that matter. So, so I've done, um, based on my research, I submit that there are three incidences of medical nationalism. And I term them biopolitical nationalism, vaccine nationalism, and epidemiological nationalism. And then having looked at um, not only academic literature, but also news media and um, literature from the WHO and UN to see what's happening at the global stage, I try to define these three forms of nationalisms to then ultimately go back and do a contextual analysis of text to measure and gauge and empirically capture the extent of medical nationalism in this country, but then also possibly in other countries. Why is that important? I think it's important because it's so difficult to give content to rights. If I say that rights like the right to health, um, it's, it's fuzzy, it's difficult to grasp, it's difficult to give content to, then I have to look at the context to understand how governments and people make sense of health rights and health security. So I do think medical nationalism, medical nationalism is quite important in that regard. So I'm aware of time, and I think it was good for me to kind of explain to you how I got stuck in medical nationalism and in this group. Um, and I hope you can see that my work also fits in well with especially the first presentation on banal nationalism and also with Nick's work. So what I will do in my, my few minutes that's left is I will just briefly tell you um, a little bit more about the three incidences of medical nationalism that I have identified and how I have defined them. Um, the first one, biopolitical nationalism, obviously derives from the concept of biopolitics that Foucault gave us in the 1970s, and I define it as the weaponizing of population health for nationalist aims. Biopolitical nationalism finds expression primarily in politics and public policy for as far as these are concerned with or influenced by biological information in the furtherance of nationalistic aims. Numerous examples of this exist um, during this current and ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Now, some may argue that this is not profound, it's not concerning, because we know that there's a link between nationalism and big global crises like COVID-19. I think it is important because the rise of the nation state in the face of a global crisis have recentered the state in our lives. Just think how easily we accepted and obeyed those restrictions. Some of them were inconsistent, it didn't make sense at all. Some of them were ridiculous, some of them just didn't make sense, but we accepted that the nation state was going to step in to protect us all. There are very interesting examples that I don't have the time to explain to today, but I would also like you to think about the relationship between China and the USA when you think about this biopolitical nationalism and how that relationship played out on the world stage and how all of us actually followed quite easily what those two countries were doing. Vaccine nationalism, I don't want to say too much about because I think probably in terms of the audience here today, that's the one that most of us you know, constantly read and encounter in the media. But I've given it a definition because like I said earlier, I, I, I find it problematic that lawyers and medical anthropologists just so easily assume that we all agree what it is. And then, um, so I'm, I'm not going to, I know that my time is running out, um, so I'm not going to bother too much with the definition, but, I, but, but my definition is quite a wide definition that also includes 
certain elements of vaccine diplomacy because pushing vaccines on the international market to Africa or other parts of the world is also for geopolitical gain. And I think um, that is, of course, um, something that we want to see, but it's also a form of vaccine nationalism. When I write about, about vaccine nationalism, I think it's very important, though, that we don't associate vaccine nationalism with COVID-19. It is we are going to make a big mistake if we associate these nationalisms only with crisis. It's part of much a much bigger problem in health law that relates also to the intellectual property re regime and patents um, that I believe is one of the sources of the vaccine nationalism that we are seeing today. And then the final nationalism um, is epidemiological nationalism. Personally, I, I enjoy writing about this. I find this very interesting. And I define epidemiological nationalism as the tracing, establishment, and sustaining of borders, whether real or imagined, but along epidemiological lines. Epidemiological nationalism does not necessarily follow formal border work in the sense of cartographic lines or coordinates. It is rather the viral transgression that delineates the epidemiological terrain and that establishes new and imagined boundaries. Now, that can sometimes lead to spatial serialism, like we found in the UK. Just think back to when we lifted the lockdown regulations, but Wales, for example, didn't follow immediately. And it was illegal, I think, to drive to the beach in England, or it was illegal to drive to the beach in Wales, but you could drive to the beach in England but there's actually no physical border between these two nations. That is what we saw at the beginning, but what we are starting to see now with immunity passports and travel restrictions is that epidemiological nationalism, which initially was not confined or did not follow cartographic lines, are re-imprinting national borders that have existed um, socially or politically or otherwise, and um, that is problematic in itself. If you think about COVID-19 having happened at a time in world history that we saw nationalist tendencies rise all over. So to conclude, um, where is this project leading and how does it fit in with this group's work and, and the work that I'm doing otherwise? Um, I'm working a lot on organized health systems and the right to health and I think the point that I essentially want to make is that um, I want to show that how we as a society deal with and how nations respond to national and global health issues or crises such as COVID-19 ultimately actually has very little to do with the law in the strict sense. It's got more to do with ideological framing and symbolism and the commandeering of real and imagined national sensibilities um, and, and how I intend to go from the theoretical taxonomy that I've completed now is next to, to do some empirical research and using software like Opinion Finder to kind, to kind of try and capture empirically medical nationalism in this nation, but I'm already also seeing the possibilities in terms of doing comparative work also um, for example, for USA and Hong Kong, how medical nationalism features in those countries and how it either obstructs and impedes or promotes um, health security and health rights. Thank you. Okay, for our final speaker uh, is Aris Kampidis. And Aris is going to present a paper on shifts in capitalism and public choice theory, a project on the future of liberal democracy. So, yeah. well, uh, well, thank you for coming here. Um, so you remember this book that was written 30 years ago called The End of History and the Last Man, when communism collapsed. Uh, prominent figures uh, such as Francis Fukuyama believe that the world is going to tr gravitate towards liberal democracy. This is the model, the political model, uh, that brings prosperity and stability across the world. And countries from uh, Asia, Africa, 
including China at some point, once they liberalize their economy, they will also follow this very successful model uh, that you know, the United States and Western Europe projected. Well, 25 years later, we got this kind of popular books on the bookshelves, How Democracies Die, Fascism by Madeleine Albright, and On Tyranny are some of the examples that we have, the proliferation of books that tells us that democracy, not only has it not succeeded in places that were supposed to gravitate towards that model, uh, such as Central Asia, Russia, and Asia, but now democracy is in retreat, if not in decline and at risk, even at, in, in, in the very core, democratic core, that was supposed to project this, this confidence 25 years ago. Um, so I was intrigued by that, uh, and the, uh, I'm going to take you through the intellectual journey of, uh, that I have done in order to come to a position which I decided to write a book about it, which I called a political theory that is research-led. It's different from hypothesis testing because it's a theory that based on uh, others, uh, the work of others, including, of course, inspired by some of my earlier work, but it is a political theory that is based on empirical observations proposing an argument about whether this can happen here in the United States and Western Europe, given that on the one hand, we had this reassurance that you know democracy is well consolidated. We had this panic with Trump and Brexit, but at the same time, we see that democracy is quite resilient because you know Trump is gone and you no know, democracy still somehow survived in the United States. We have the alternation of power. Maybe those, uh, those books were quite alarmist and anyway, we live in democracies that are far from perfect. We know that they're far from perfect. We have political inequalities. We have people who are more privileged than others, lobbies, political elites, organized special interests, party supporters. They enjoy political privilege by virtue of their resource advantages and their position in institutions. Something that I defined as political privilege is different groups having set of properties that they enjoy that gives them an advantage in terms of access to political decision making compared to what the formal structure of representation offered to all citizens as individuals. We already live in imperfect democracies. And on the other side, the flip side of that is the lack of privilege, the underrepresentation that we have women and other gender dimensions, ethnic groups, racial minorities, lower income people, uh, people of the, of that didn't have the same educational opportunities, people who have migrant status, well, such as me, for example, uh, they are facing different patterns of institutional exclusion and structural discrimination on top of several stereotypes that are reflected in the, 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 the electoral process, but how people elect the representatives. So we don't live in a, we live in a democracy that is imperfect. There are many pathologies and deficiencies. I wrote an article about that a few years ago, adding age as a statute dimension uh, that, you know, we have to look at other groups, including uh, younger and older voters. But I never thought that I would be in a position to discuss you know, the, the decline, democratic backsliding in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in the West, in the United States, in Europe, in places where democracy was consolidated. Now, my earlier democratic theory in that article suggested, as Nick earlier uh, talked about, uh, that democracy is a field of contestability. It is imperfect, but it allows us allows the demos, the people, okay, to have some form of exercise, some form of control over the kratos, the power. So it's not that we are in position of power, that's an oxymoron, as I say earlier in my book, you can't have demos in control of the kratos. Essentially, you have a symmetrical resources and the problem of domination that modern societies try to handle so that nobody would dominate a leader, a monarch, the aristocracy. And this is this happens through collective action. Uh, political empowerment is when we pool resources and we form groups, but it can be trade unions, professional organizations, the media, and try to keep power checked, to try the demos, uh, try to manifest itself as somehow, somehow uh, 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 with power resources as a contestant in politics. And essentially democracy is defense against domination. It was designed, whether in the United States particularly, which is a prototype, when it was a very exclusionary project, by the way, uh, that excluded women and slaves. It was designed among elites to prevent a new king from emerging in that context. And it did a very good job. And at the same time, others wanted to, other groups wanted to step in and get those entitlements. You had the, this, this widening of, 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 of the voting of citizenship 
and that thing worked pretty well despite the, the pathologies and the uh, and the uh, and the, the weaknesses that uh, uh, a few of them I just mentioned. Now this is where I come to the notion of structure of political liberty that this process of democratization, imperfect as it was, was based on a socioeconomic context that needs to be explored because once you have this socioeconomic context, you're supposed to have a guarantee that this system is sustainable. But we need to see whether there are changes in that structure, in that socioeconomic structure that might suggest that the, re the reversal process is in place. Because so far we focus on strategy, on ret rhetoric, on Trump, on the ideology of the far right, on decisions, and less on structure, on the socioeconomic conditions that make democracies very, very resilient against potential wannabe authoritarians, fascists, and so on. And I try to explore the interplay between economic structure, how capitalism changes, and political strategy. Okay, And I focus on history as well, because I want to see how democracy emerged against the very initially hostile political environment and how political hegemony was consolidated in other places. Ten years ago, I started a project comparing Slovakia and Belarus in the 1990s. Both of those countries had leaders who wanted to impose from a kind of one party dominant uh, regime, a hegemonic regime. And both of them found that an opportunity structure, but those, different, those two countries have a different contrast space, as I call it, different obstacles that uh, those leaders faced that explain why Belarus became a hegemonic, semi-authoritarian country, and Slovakia didn't. There is a degree of comparability. Those cases are not identical. They're quite similar. And you have always have difficulties you know, getting through peer review, trying to say that, no, there is a, some comparability here. Uh, and the, the focus, of course, was in the so-called countervailing powers, the social powers, the political parties, the institutional obstacles that they faced, they had differences in one, one country with the presidential system, the other one was parliamentary, and civil society, the autonomy and the strength of civil society and the media from the leader. Now, 10 years later, after I'd gone through a lot of uh, <laughs> hardship, and I, uh, I got it published, uh, and uh, this is the springboard for the book uh, about the you know, pathway to hegemony. I distinguish between the contrast space, the obstacles to a, a strategy of autocratization, socioeconomic pluralism, there are cleavages and policy division. How can a leader essentially get the consent of the vast majority again and again and again when the society is divided over issues or even over identity? The, even policies generate dissent, and this dissent will be expressed by opponents, within party opponents and outside opponents. There are also checks and balances, judiciary, the judiciary is supposed to be independent. There are multiple political networks. How can they all come under the banner, under the umbrella of a single leader? And there is strong opposition, particularly in the West. On the other side, the opportunity structure that one of the authoritarians have is if they succeed in diminishing socioeconomic pluralism, which is the source of empowerment for different groups, when they can find resources and come as autonomous contestants the erosion of checks and balances, the independent judiciary in all but name, the centralization of party control under strong leadership, and the subsequent weakening of the opposition who can't find allies, social allies, to be able to be visible, to have resources to compete. That kind of uh, knowledge that I got from those two cases, I match it with my project on clientelism, also known as patronage, patron-client relations, favoritism, that I observed in Greece. Now, in, client, in clientelism, something that happens in democracy, the pathology of democracy, political clients receive selective benefits for patrons. From, and they, in return, they have to offer their political support. So it's a distribution of socioeconomic resources, of selective benefits through an explicit agreement. Will you support me? So it's an exchange between those who have political power and those who want to take something in return of offering something else. They can offer not just their vote, but they can offer their time, their commitment, they can become party members, or they can offer donations or media, if they have media power, media visibility. And of course, in Greece, there were two major parties. So that was that balances, there was a balance between those two parties because they both played the game. But I observed that clientelism or patronage is not just vote buying, which is what you see here. Actually, you cannot buy all the voters. You know, there, no party has the resources to buy everybody. But you target 
those uh, active supporters, the media owners, the big companies, the big donors, maybe some trade unions, the professional organizations, because if you co-opt them, then they will be members of your own uh, power campaign. They can be valuable campaign resources and spread your message to the electorate. So clientelism has an indirect effect between you know, party strategy and electoral mobilization. If one party cap has an exclusive uh, uh, access to clientelism, then others, other parties won't be able to find the same resources to counteract, to offset that electoral mobilization uh, uh, um, um, advantage. And hence, we create clientelist networks. Clientelism is a mode of interest accommodation. You come to me, I'll give you a job, I'll give you a contract, okay? I'll give you something in return for your loyalty, for your allegiance. It's also a method of political mobilization, much more powerful than just ideology. I can be ideologically motivated, but I'm not going to dedicate 100% of my time or 70% of my time for your cause. And I may be disappointed when you don't deliver on your promises. But if I get selective benefits, I can tolerate you having uh, reneged on your promises and you know, having a, bad, a worse record than expected. I'm much more loyal because I get material benefits. It is a strategy of organization in general. It's a solution to the collective action problem, as I said earlier. How can you incentivize people to support you, even no matter what, even if you are revealed to be you know, not as great politician as expected? And clientelist groups become privileged groups because this is a kind of capitalism in which everybody else has to compete, to work hard, to get new ideas in the market, to you know, risk losing your business, going bankrupt, losing, getting, being redundant. But some groups have all these privileges, subsidies, state aid protections, and they are the political insiders and they, uh, they, they are the supporters. I've written it, this down in this paper in Journal of European Public Policy, what I call the political parties, essentially clientelist machines in Greece. And I dis discerned a relationship of perverse accountability, that they have a privileged position, but they also lose their autonomy. Okay, they have to keep supporting the leader. They have to maintain this relationship. They have a, an advantage in bargaining, but they're not autonomous. So civil society becomes less and less autonomous as parties become networks of rent extracting actors and brokers of special interests, which is quite a green image of politics. And then in democratization, uh, uh, in, in this article, clientelism and the classification of dominant party systems, I said that if one party has a monopoly over this uh, mechanism, then it, political hegemony is possible by preempting the rise of any contestation from other political forces that will be unable to find social allies if they cannot promise or credibly offer clientelist benefits. Clientelism matters, but also the leverage of the state in the economy matters, because if this, the, the role of the state in it is, is, is still limited, then how much clientelist uh, benefits you can offer is equally limited. So the more you expand the state sector and the economy, not necessarily by ownership, but by you know, state aid and subsidies and so on, regulations that are discretionary, the more effective this strategy becomes. In my paper with Nick Cowan, we made a distinction between wealth, the welfare state in which entitlements are impersonal and there's little scope for discrimination and discretion and protectionism and other subsidies and regulations that are more susceptible to clientelism because you can pick winners and losers. And this is the shift of capitalism that I'm observing right now towards protectionism, towards more active role of the state in the economy, not necessarily enhancing the welfare state or broadening access to education everybody's entitled to, but essentially picking winners in the name of you know, finding the national champion or you know, subsidizing the companies that are in trouble, the energy companies and so on. So it matters what kind of economic structure we're heading for. So uh, finishing my, uh, my, my presentation, I'm observing shifts in capitalism to see to which extent the changes that we observe undermine the strength of socioeconomic pluralism. Through clientelism undermines the resilience of checks and balances because members of the judiciary can also be co-opted if they have family business, they have family ties. I try to see the nature of political networking that emerges whether we have a pyramid-like hierarchy or not and finally when to which extent an open level playing field in politics would survive and then the last one the two possibilities that i have identified one is that we have 
a situation where political power will be captured by economic elite actors. But then you have a dominant network, not a dominant leader, a dominant network that settles its own privileges by arranging preferential access in different economic sectors. So you're not going to get Putin or Orban, but you are getting a dominant network, a pre-selectorate privileged network. And checks and balances will work to sustain its function under this facade of equal rights and representation. And finally, the second possibility is that this system will essentially merge under a more pyramid-like structure, under the hegemony of a leading leader on organi an organization. And then in that kind of, 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 of development, one that we have seen in Russia, for instance, where the oligarch was supposed to rule Russia, but then you know Putin chose the favorite ones and exterminated the others, something that we see in an authoritarian regime in China, when the billionaires now are being purged, maybe this might happen even in some Western economies, Western systems, where you know eventually once you have a dominant network, there will be a concentrate a, a, a coordinating center to bring that kind of hegemony by uh, uh, that kind of shift of, of 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 capitalism. So thank you for your time. Thanks, okay, um, thanks everyone. So we've got some time, thirteen minutes for questions. <laughs> Uh, so I'm opening to the floor. Does anyone have any questions for any of the presenters? I don't know whether Christian. I can try and bring Christian. Back. See if we can. Christian can hear us. Um, Thank you. So, are there any questions at the moment? Let's see. Christian, can you hear us? Yep. <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys can still hear me. I I certainly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks. So next that's, that's not live. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's from. There oh, we okay. go. There we go. We've got to wind it on. I think that's why we got last on there. <laughs> okay, let's. <laughs> let's um, thanks. We have a question from Adele. So, or maybe more than a question. Uh, no, just one. Okay. Um, so, so, uh, and I'm not sure whether you were also troubled with it and the teaching that up or not, I'm not sure where you were on that, but it seems to me that people in that situation probably can't help but be scared because the politics is what you So to give the example of what's happening in the United States at the moment, it's all about the president's perspective. Now if you read about Yeah, no, no, that's that's absolutely um, that's absolutely correct, um, and that it, that actually aligns with the with the point that uh, we're trying to make because um, the people that we're dealing yeah, with will say, well, that actually aligns with the with the point. Okay, <laughs> now, now, now I'm going to suddenly stop, like you like in a, few, in a few seconds' time, and then okay, let me see. Okay, that's um, so. Um, uh, Basically, we're dealing with the people who believe that you uh, cannot like um, talk about policy decisions unless, for example, you know who your MP is or you know, like, say, who the current, uh, you know, welfare secretary is. Sometimes even things like, oh, you, do you know who the current prime minister is? Do you know what the prime, you know, that that kind of thing. And uh, so our argument is that that kind of definition of knowledge is extremely biased 
uh, against um, uh, the people who have been defined by these people as, as being ignorant of public affairs. So our, our point would be that, um, that uh, it is precisely for that reason that you need to push for the inclusion of everyone uh, kind of involved. I mean, um, we, we draw a little bit on some empirical research there. It, it does reflect kind of the US experience, which is, uh, but I think there are parallels in this country, which is basically, literally, it's harder for people in some economic circumstances to even find out where they are supposed to vote. So it's like, and, and also harder for them to say, get off a shift at work or to kind of find childcare so that they can go and vote within the kind of allotted time that they, they've got. So it's, a, it's actually a disadvantage of time that is kind of very intrinsic to the challenges of people participating in public affairs. And so that's why, for example, there's a lot of get out the vote kind of ideas where you say, you know, you, you give people a lift to the polling station, that kind of thing. In the US, there's been a lot of attempts to basically try and shut down those kind of services um, because, you know, on, on the ba basically on, in an attempt to uh, to kind of like rig the vote in, 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 in a way. And uh, our, our argument is that, um, uh, you know, in order to have a competitive democracy, you need to make it as easy as possible for people to access relevant information. But they're going to have knowledge already, as, 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 as you said. The important thing at that point is making sure it's as easy for them to vote, vote in a very, very simple, you know, like vote from their phone, vote by post, or um, vote, you know, with, with extended hours in, 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 um, in, in ballots, essentially. Well, uh, Mark and Yeah, good. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rita. Thanks, uh, thanks, everybody. It's nice to have you know, both in a great panel session. I think that's great. It's good to, uh, it's good to be back in that environment. So, um, um, I guess my, my question follows on from uh, from Adele's really is that um, uh, in terms of this uh, this kind of uh, linkage aspect that you saw on the that you talked about, me, I'm thinking about. How much political parties really uh, really come up in your in your analysis, and this might be something for, for Christian perhaps as well, in how much political parties may try and shape uh, memory and uh, sort of views of, of nationalism as well, and whether the the problem is perhaps that parties are not fulfilling their traditional functions or what we thought were their traditional functions of, of linkage, education, information, mobilisation. They might be mobilising, but they're certainly not informing uh, and educating. So I wondered, I wondered whether, you know, when we talk about whether, you know, the, the role of parties perhaps, uh, they might be like to all of the papers perhaps. Well, I, I, could, I could say uh, briefly that, you know, I think our, our account would endorse the idea that, 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 that a key role of, um, of, uh, of parties is, is, to, um, is to try and educate people in order to kind of persuade them that this is what we can do for you. That, that's the idea. So that it is, it is. So it's kind of, it's intrinsically selective and competitive. So in other words, they're going to educate the voters with a view to trying to win them around. Um, but in a competitive democracy, that process where every party is simultaneously trying to reach out to lots and lots of potential constituents, kind of produces, uh, helps to generate the kind of knowledge that um, that, that eventually produces good good policy. And so, I mean, our argument. Um, I, I think I, I kind of have a slightly. Um, I don't. I don't think of, of like as say this democracy that we're in right now is necessarily in a crisis. It's kind of in a sense that there are still quite a lot of resilient elements to it that are kind of that are kind of going on. And so in that sense, their traditional role is still present. Um, but in so far as it's failing, our argument is the is is you want to try and make um, the party well the, the competition between parties more competitive. Rather than less competitive, as as um, you know, some people are, are dealing with, um, some people are suggesting instead. I don't know if Christian can want to come in. Well. Uh, can you guys hear me? If when I speak, yeah. Am I audible at all? Okay, I'm. I'm hoping I'm. Um, I really like the question, Mark. Um, I think you're pointing at um, at a real problem in. In, in Michael Billig's um, thesis on banal nationalism, it's been criticised for the wrong reasons. 
um, as I said, lots of people, have, at least one person, has, has kind of made a, a, an academic career for for themselves by saying Billig doesn't understand the difference between hot and banal nationalism, which of course is nonsense. If you read uh, Billig's book properly, he's very clear about that distinction. But what what you're pointing out is actually a, a kind of absence in in his work, um, and the, and it's it's an empirical question. You know, how do different parties with different uh, traditions articulate their version of banal nationalism, and what role does the sort of nationalist myth making play in different party discourses? I, you know, if I think about the context I know best, and there you can certainly kind of um, see party disagreements over over historical narratives, over questions of you know sort of national mythology, but also the a sort of self ascribed status of, of 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 the nation being the victim of outside forces, and then you get sort of other other political parties questioning that. And it doesn't always map onto the left-right spectrum quite as straightforwardly as you might expect or as one might predict. And I think in, in the UK, uh, that's that's actually almost the outline of a really interesting research project. You know, how, how do the Tories and how do Labour differ from one from each other in their different versions of what someone like uh, Paul Gilroy describes Britain's post-colonial or post-imperial melancholia, which is you know a, a sort of version of of memory nationalism. And as far as I can tell, that's really an under-researched area. So I think you, you're pointing, or you're kind of almost preparing a springboard for some really for some really important research questions. What kind of internal um, diver differences and divergences are there in the the nationalist myth? myths being articulated and how do they transmit themselves in a banal or, or hot fashion so i'm just kind of endorsing or amplifying your question in some ways mark thanks christian josh no it's a question for nick and arithmetic it's maybe a silly question but you talk a lot about competition uh, both in terms of the market and in terms of politics, and drawing voters the intolerant into this competitive market. What role does collaboration play in this process? And is there another way of thinking about it more into, in terms of how can we pull these people into the democratic process through a collaborative process rather than a competitive process? Well, my, my take on uh, competition within both these processes is that, is that at every stage, they're actually competing to cooperate. So it's just a question over like, it's not it, it's not like, oh, it's like you're, you're gonna be the one big winner. In politics, you always need a lot of allies in order to kind of, in order to work together. So the question is, who is gonna come in and collaborate with you at the, at the, at the table? So in that sense, collaboration is, is, in, is intrinsic to like, to the, to, to the process. Um, Which is what we make it collaborative though, because it's both it depends on the voting system. Well, as I say, it's, it's like it's you're voting for the person who you think you can best cooperate with. Um, so ultimately, it's uh, it, it's a kind of collaboration that you're voting for. It's like the structure of the collaboration that you're that you're agreeing to. And I think our argument would be that it's the it's the kind of the it's, it's a different set of options that are kind of being presented. That ensures the collaboration is is productive. That's uh, so. I, I see them as like two sides of the same coin. In, in that sense, you know, you can cooperate with Tesco one day, or you can cooperate with Sainsbury's the next day. Uh, but you can only collaborate with them well if the two of them are looking at each other, going like, "Okay, we have to at least be able to match like what their what their offering is." Um, and that's that's you know, ge generally speaking, that's that's quite a benign aspect of of, um, of like social process. Uh, Harrison Anders, did you want to come in on any questions? Yes, yes, I will, uh, but you can. No, I can maybe just one. comment on an earlier question about political parties and in terms of my work on medical nationalism specifically, and what was also said about the null nationalism. This idea of memory, and especially the UK's um, history and um, kind of imperial memory, it what maybe started me in medical nationalism was that there's still a lot of that in Hong Kong as well. Um, I remember I had this dissertation student who constantly wrote in a dissertation that Hong Kong has got one of the best medical systems in the world. And then I would mark it every time and I would say, well, that's kind of a sweeping statement. You have to substantiate it, reference it. 
And the answer was, but everybody knows that. It's like the British system. You don't have to reference it. it you just know the NHS is great. And Hong Kong's health system is based on the NHS. And that is why our system is also great. So um, I find that interesting across borders. And I also find it interesting how political, our political parties play on that memory in countries with universal health care systems like here in Hong Kong and exactly in the opposite way in the USA our health is weaponized when it comes to elections and the same kind of happens in South Africa as well countries who do not have this history about you know universal health for their citizens yes um, Adele you had a question about political knowledge we don't define political knowledge as something that is objectively true because the authors that we argue against say, oh, well, we don't know what the economic theories say that the right economic policy is. Well, we've seen that economists argue with one another and they can't actually agree on whether you can be Keynesian or monetarist and whatever. The, the, the knowledge is essentially the idea that you have your own experiences, you have your own worries, you have an anxieties. And if you express them, this is a valuable piece of knowledge that feeds back into a mechanism of discovery, that politicians have to discover what your concerns are, your experience are. If they exclude you because they think that you don't have the objective knowledge of knowing what you know, the, the, the constitutional setup in the United Kingdom is or what the economic policy is, if they exclude you, you, you lose your voice, you lose that kind of input. You're no longer a consumer of smartphones, essentially. You're outside that competitive process of discovery, and you're also discredited, not just in the voting process, but in your collective action, which is exactly where collaboration is, where Joshua is, where you pull resources to have a standing. So if I come up and say, well, as an immigrant, as a non-UK citizen, if I organize that action, I'm already discredited by not being a, a citizen. So if you are already disqualified because you're ignorant, label ignorant, so you don't have the chance of entering this group of the knowledgeable, then you're, you're also, your voice, your experience is, 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 is silenced. And bear in mind that the, the citizenship tests were applied in the American South, and they were targeting the, the black African population, that the population that went out of slavery and then later experienced institutional racism and didn't have the same educational opportunities to be able to pass that test. So there was a form of, of, of exclusion that was that's quite benign, actually, in its history. Okay, I think, um, well, thanks for the questions and thanks for answering. I think we're going to have to uh, leave it there and, and finish up because we're over time. Um, so first of all, I want to thank everyone for, for coming to our launch and for allowing us to introduce the politics of the Tory research group to you. And we'll, just, so just a note, our plan is actually on the 22nd of November, which is a Monday, we're going to have an inaugural lecture. Um, it's been a process of organising this and the speaker will be um, Joseph McKinley from the University of Newcastle, who has written research widely on media population and again in China. She was also the one academic who was in the list of France in the British citizens uh, in traveling China. So actually, Joe was planning to actually talk us through her research and how she ended up in this month's newspaper um, uh, as the band's uh, 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 academic in China. Um, so we'll also be doing other events hopefully in the near future. We're here. This is the group, uh, some members of the group in our research, and we're interested in reaching out to other colleagues in the university and beyond. Um, so with that, I just want to say thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks to our presenters and, and, and Christian there. Thanks also to Sean, um, who sort of navigated us through this sort of technological uh, quagmire um, and, and done so admirably and very well. So thanks, everyone. And thanks and to you, Rico, for organizing it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.